So if you don't want to eat a dead animal, mm. maybe you could stuff it. Uh, I wouldn't recommend a prawn for that, no. <laughs> that might be a bit difficult. <laughs> yes. However, the, uh, the art of preserving dead animals, taxidermy, uh, it was hugely popular during the Victorian era. Now a Melbourne artist and jeweller is helping to popularise the craft once again by ensuring her animals are ethically sourced. Julia Deville admits she's had a lifelong fascination with death and she told Jane Hutchin that the ethical use of dead animals to create art is both respectful and provocative. Julia, you're an artist and a taxidermist. When did you get interest in stuffing animals? Um, I've been interested in animals since I was a little girl, but when I was about 16, I realised that taxidermy was actually something you could learn how to do. So I started hunting for a taxidermy teacher, but no one would take me seriously because I was a 16 year old girl. And then when I moved to Melbourne, when I was about 17 or 18, I found a retired taxidermist and he offered to teach me. When you first saw a stuffed animal, what went through your mind? Well, I think my first encounter was my grandmother's fox fur stoles and you kind of wear them around your neck and the mouth would open up and bite onto the tail and it had like all the legs and everything in it. And I was fascinated by it. I kind of felt like it, it was still alive in a way or that maybe when I wasn't looking it would come to life. And, you know, I used to dress up in them and wear them to fancy dress parties and all of that. And um, so, and I, that would have been when I was four or five or something. So it was ingrained really early. And then when I was 16, I bought my first piece of taxidermy, which was a, a eight pointer stag's head in the antique shop. And that's what really kicked me off into wanting to learn how to do it. And so was there a lot of art around the house? Were there stuffed animals around your house? Not stuffed animals, but my dad's quite eccentric and both of my parents are very creative. So they're both interested in art and interested in making things. Julia, one day when you were in kindergarten, you brought an interesting item to show and tell. What was it? Uh, I took a shark's head into kindy and my teacher was pregnant and she threw up and I was eventually banned from show and tell. I was always fascinated by death and that sort of thing I think because dad was a scuba diver he was always bringing back crayfish and fish and octopus and I would kind of play with it and I was quite familiar with those things so it wasn't scary to me it was just interesting. And where did that lead after being banned from show and tell? Did you continue your interest in dead things? Yeah, well, I guess Dad would always encourage me to, you know, to investigate and to play with things and look at things. And even, I think, when I was about seven or eight, we were in the country and we went for a walk, and just Dad and I, and there was an old church which we wandered into and there was a coffin in the middle of the church with an elderly lady's body in it and there was no one around, it was quite bizarre. I still remember it clear as day and he encouraged me to touch the woman's face and feel what a dead body felt like. So I got quite a visceral perception of you know, the difference between death and life with a human at a very young age and then when both of my grandmothers died I was allowed to see their bodies and touch them as well. So jewellery and then into taxidermy. Yeah. What was the first full piece that you made? Well I started learning taxidermy at the same time I started doing jewellery just coincidentally. I was working mainly with small birds and mice just because I was working on things that I found dead and I think one of the first pieces I did was a little mouse brooch that had emerald eyes and a silver tail and it just slowly grew from there. You know, I did more and more jewellery pieces with taxidermy but then it eventually flipped into doing taxidermy sculptures with jewellery decorations. How do you come by your animals? So they're all ethically sourced, mainly donated. So I have a lot of people that will either donate pets to me or they'll call me up and say they've found a dead bird somewhere or a dead fox on the side of the road. And I also have farmer contacts and taxidermists and museums who also provide me with stillborn animals or animals that have been donated to them. You've got um, a Clydesdale horse. Yeah. You've got a, a sweet little baby alpaca. How did you come across those items? So the alpaca came from a taxidermist in a museum who just has a whole freezer full of stuff and I can kind of take my pick generally. And the Clydesdale was 
a friend, it was her partner's pet, and he had to be put down, so they called me up and offered it to me. I realised very early on that there's something in us that must go on after we die, because once there's a dead body there, that's gone, and you know, where does it go, I don't know. You have this animal, and it's this beautiful thing, but once it's dead, it's, it's still beautiful, but it's a very different thing, and it's, it's hard, and it's cold, and it doesn't, it doesn't have the same characteristics, but I kind of want to celebrate the life of that animal that it did have through the taxidermy work, and it's about respect and, and showing that admiration and that beauty. I don't want to make grotesque pieces or frightening pieces. I want them to be fragile and delicate. Do you think, in a sense, art, taxidermy and, and jewellery can open up discussions about death? Yeah, I didn't actually think so when I got into it, but I've had a few exhibitions that have actually done that, um, where I've had a, an overwhelming response from my audience that it's changed the way they think about life and death and the way we treat animals. It's still quite a, a powerful experience to see a dead thing because it is hidden from us a lot these days. So I think when people are confronted with taxidermy, it kind of makes them reflect on their own mortality and and what they really feel about death and life and all that's in between. You've just been sent a baby giraffe. Yes. How does one come across a baby giraffe? So it was in the freezer of the Queen Vic Museum in Launceston. It had been there for over 30 years. It originally died in the Adelaide Zoo. And I found out about it and started harassing them to sell it to me, which they wouldn't. And after about five years of harassment, they agreed. And yeah, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity, especially, you know, to come across one that's died of natural causes. You were once looking into compressing the ashes of a dead person into a diamond. Yeah. Is that possible? Yeah, I'm actually, my mum's agreed to have that done to her when she dies. So. We'll probably get two half carat diamonds and I'd make my sister and myself a ring with her. And she really likes that idea. So it's, it's quite popular these days. But diamond is just made of carbon. So they take the ash and they compress it under intense heat and pressure, which is the way diamonds are formed in the earth. And they can make any size and they can do all different colored diamonds and everything. And it's actually a... It's chemically a diamond, it's just man-made. What about your dad? What would he like to be made into? Well, Dad's, Dad says that when he's too old to go diving, he's just going to go out on his boat and not come back. So I don't know if I'll have access to his body. <laughs> it just depends. But, yeah, he's, I don't think he's too fussed about what happens to him either. Julia Deville, thanks so much for speaking with me. Thank you, it was a pleasure.